Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. On our show today, certified management consultant Jennifer Leake will discuss her best job ever program and how employers may have to do more these days to hold on to workers. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Gene. Thanks. Before we get into, talk about your background. You had a uh, you were a pharmacist at one point, and you, yes. and you got into pharmaceutical sales. Yes, I, um, I was a pharmacist. I grew up in a, a drugstore uh, at the age of 16 in my hometown, which when we talk a little bit later about best job ever is where it came from. Right. And I went to pharmacy school. I was in community pharmacy and then was recruited by Eli Lilly and was in pharmaceutical sales. How'd you like working for a big company like that? Or were you, were you frustrated? I know some people that work for big companies are frustrated that they see things they want to change and they can't, it doesn't happen that quickly. Actually, for me, it was a great move because growing up uh, working in a community pharmacy, I worked every Saturday. I had two Saturdays off in seven years. So mm. to suddenly have an expense account, a company car, and yeah. work Monday through Friday was, right. was a good thing. And I met my husband there, so it was, a, it was a great move. I did go to another company, and the other side of worst job ever happened when I went to this other company after I got married and uh, was promoted into a position with a boss I didn't like. And that's what finally got me to leave corporate America. I had no intentions of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked working for a company. I, I, I'm a, I believe in the company I work for. And when I stopped, uh, I never went back to corporate America after that. And that's one of the things you do, and we'll get into that, is you, you work with company management on, on their style or whatever. But it, it, does it make you think of how many good, talented people have left jobs because the person they report to or whatever is just not communicating with them or doesn't have the, doesn't inspire them, that type of thing. It happens a lot. Not leave, not liking your boss is the number one reason people leave a job. Really? Yes. As opposed to pay or anything like that? Right. You put up with a lot if you have a leader that you're you, that you go to bat for, that goes, bat, goes to bat for you and that right. you work for. So yes, it's the number one reason people leave a job. Hmm. I want to talk about something in the news. There's a record number, Jennifer, of people leaving their jobs right now and a record number of job openings. Uh, you know, it's helped lead to the supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. People want higher pay and better working conditions. And, um, you know, some want to keep working from home like they did during the height of the pandemic. And some companies are mm -hmm. saying that's okay. Otherwise, other companies are saying come back to work. But well, what's going on? I mean, and how much of this, this current situation can you, can you tie to the pandemic? And well, maybe what did the pandemic uncover? Well, definitely remote working, something that people were doing a little bit, but remote working was going to be a temporary thing and it's not going to go away. So the pandemic definitely created the remote worker and that brings a whole different kind of um, situation because some people aren't really meant to be remote workers. They, they need the, either the structure or mm -hmm. the discipline of an office uh, or the loneliness of a remote worker. Uh, so that's, the remote worker is one thing that the pandemic, but I think the, the leaving, uh, there was more work-life balance. People could work at home, they saw their families, they didn't have to commute. You know, big cities where you have two hour commutes each way. Right. That nobody wants to go back to that. They want that work-life balance. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why people are, are mm -hmm. saying, I'm not gonna go back yeah. to that and I'm gonna look for something else. Remote worker also opened up the job opportunities. You didn't have to work in your town anymore. You didn't have to work near your home. You could work from anywhere. Right, and I think a lot of companies found that workers were just as productive, if not more productive. Maybe not in every case, but mo a lot of them were very productive working at home. Yes, it showed that remote working, when managed properly and having a process for it, can work, can do it. Mm -hmm. um, I th I, this is not mo on workers, but I think anybody can um, appreciate that customer service has been a challenge. Uh, you, you just call anybody. I have this one company I have to call over and over because we can't resolve something, and I know it's going to be a two-hour wait. Mm -hmm. So I just sit there with my phone for two hours and, yeah, I've I, been and, there. and mentally do it. So remote working has some great advantages for the worker, the, the flexibility, the, the lack of commute time, the more productivity because they're not in a car four hours a day. Now they can work those four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it also has brought some things because it's not meant for everybody. It's not meant for every industry. What are the challenges if you're managing remote workers as far as um, you're not going to get them in a room, uh, you 
got to get them on a Zoom call or something. But what are the are there challenges? And and is that maybe where you really need to have good communication skills, Jennifer, if you're going to be managing people and inspiring them remotely? I think some of the things, and I had this question asked to me before, some of the things you would do with the person you would still do remotely. So making sure they know their expectations and their job functions and their roles and their responsibilities, and then have some kind of an accountability method to do that, and then communication and ongoing things. Uh, the Probably one of the things I've heard back from remote workers that's a challenge is that they're by themselves, they're isolated, they're lonely. And so how are you going to create that team connection in a remote working environment, as well as how do you train them, how do you, uh, you can't have, the, I think the biggest thing with remote workers is that if you had a problem before, you went out the, your door and down the hall and talked to somebody, and now you're pretty much on your own. So there's actually an assessment that I, that a, one of my companies I work with brought out, and we used it uh, in the beginning of the remote workers, and it has the personality traits that can hinder or help you be a remote worker. So when you're hiring, know if they possess those, and then also know how to individually manage a person. And that individual management of people, not the one size all management, doesn't matter if they're remote or not. That's a, that's a mm. good function of a manager anyway. But if you're hiring people and you want them to work, work remote, you're saying now there's sort of a profile or sort of a, a, a pathway that employers can look at mm -hmm. to kind of determine whether or not somebody would be a good remote worker. Yes, whether they are, Things like, you know, how are they going to work as a team by themselves? How, uh, what kind of accountability? Um, are, will they feel lonely? Do they need people? I need people around me. I work a lot on my own, but I do a lot of Zoom calls, so that sort mm -hmm. of makes me feel like I'm with people. Yeah. I like the alone time, and I worked, for, I worked at home for a while with mm -hmm. the radio station, but I, I sort of miss the energy of the office at times, mm -hmm. so I was glad when I went back. Um, before I ask you about best job ever, um, you know, there's been reports also, Jennifer, that it seems like the worker, the employee now, is in a better position. Maybe they've, they've been in decades as far as looking for higher pay, more flexibility on working conditions and all that. Again, a lot of it tied to the pandemic and the fact that, you know, there were a lot of people that were getting an extra three to six hundred dollars a week, maybe people towards the lower end of the job scale, and they're like, they were able to pay some more bills or pay for child care or whatever, and so they're looking for those type of jobs. So are those workers that are looking for jobs in a better place? And, and do, do employers have to keep an eye, eye out for that and, and maybe up the starting pay in a lot of cases and, and maybe work with employer, employees as far as conditions? Well, I think there's a lot of things that contribute to why employees want more money. Uh, things cost more now, so they're looking for more money. Um, I think, I know when I was a manager, if we raised somebody's salary, even a current employee, it, that was a temporary bump. It's not, I think maybe starting pay is something, but if you have an employee who says, I'm gonna switch jobs for 50 cents or a dollar more per hour, you could lose them for that too. So the, the key is not so much, you have to pay a, a good wage, a fair wage, know what your market is paying compared to the position you have. So doing sort of a, a, a salary analysis is a good thing. But I think more importantly is you've got to keep your current employees happy so they don't leave. And pay is one thing, but there's more things on their mind. It's not their number one thing. Uh, that work-life balance, that flexibility, belonging and knowing what, they're, uh, what, they, what, what the company is for. And then uh, the other thing that they're, they want, especially the younger um, millennial and, and Gen Zs, they want a company that has corporate responsibility. So they are really looking for what's What's the, what's the, what are we here for? And they also want to know what's my next step career-wise. So if they have a pathway, they know where they are, they know where they belong, they understand and, and buy into the corporate or the company's um, mission and, and role in the, work in, in, the, in the community or wherever they function, and then see what's next for them, this is where I'm going to go, they'll stay longer rather than dangling another pay raise in mm -hmm. front of them. So is it, Im is it important for employers, companies, to roll all that out, to let people know what their mission is, to let them know how environmentally responsible or you know receptive to the community they are. Is it important for them to roll that out? Absolutely, and I think that you know I, I, th I can't I should know this, but there's a company that made millions of dollars in socks. I, th I think the company starts with a B, and they've given a for every sock 
pair of socks you buy, they donate a pair of socks. That's they were the, one of the first ones to do like that. Langa or something. Bongo or yeah, yeah Bogo I, I, or I don't they know. They make running socks. I yes, have socks, yeah. and they're and they're great socks. But they ha they started out with every time you buy a pair of socks, we will donate a pair. And and their commercials talk about the millions of sock pairs uh, because that's what I guess most homeless people don't have enough socks. Mm -hmm. So that was a mission that people could just buy into and be part of. Do employers have to work hard? You know, in this kind of job climate where there are so many openings. Do employers mm -hmm. have to work harder, Jennifer, to hold on to people? That Yes, and I've, it's funny, but hiring, the right hire helps you hold on to them. Right. And then once you hire them, treating them right helps you hold on to them. And if you don't have op openings, you don't have to hire. So hiring is so critical, not only in the beginning, but also keeping, mm -hmm. keeping them with you. And I'm wondering if millennials, and especially is it Gen Z, yes. the newest crop, are they are they more apt to want to switch jobs early in their career as opposed to a generation ago or two generations ago where you wanted to work for 40 years for one company, get your gold watch and be sent off? But are they more willing to kind of hopscotch around to look for something invigorating, something different? You know, it's funny you should ask that because there is an article that I read that at the age group of maybe out of high school, out of college, that entry thing, they looked at every generation all the way back to, I think, boomers, maybe even before. And in that age group, jumping around on jobs was not much different depending oh, really? yeah, on each, in each generation. Because you're trying jobs on, you're trying to figure out what do I want to be when I grow up. And just because I graduated high school or I got a job uh, or I went to college, I changed my major three times in college. Um, th every, every generation in that age is thinking, what, are we, what do I want to be when I grow up? And so there's job changes. They, there was that part where companies People saw their, their parents have worked for a company for 25, 30 years. Company goes belly up or doesn't do the pensions and, that they right. promised. And so that affected people. But the beginning part of the jumping jobs, I don't think is. I think why we're seeing millennials jump more is because they're 75% of the workforce by 2025. Yikes. So, of course, that's going to be the ones changing the job because they're the biggest and the, and, and the most current workforce right so now. So they should have some more leverage at some point. Maybe? You know, I, I like, you've said the word leverage a couple of times, and, and I guess it's a word that I can't bond with because I don't, I think it should be a partnership between the employee and the, and the mm. company. And if we talk about who has more leverage. Antagonistic. Yes. And so I think both the organization, both, both the, and it's not an organization, the people who own the company and the workers who support the company, they should be a partnership with the same goals, the same mission, understanding their role and what they're supposed to do, respect and trust and, and all those things together, I think create a company that will be profitable and productive and be here for a while. Hmm. Let's talk about the Best Job Ever program. That's also the name of a column that you write bi-monthly for Valley Business Front Magazine, but talk about Best Job Ever, what that program is. And you said it's sort of based on your beginnings in the mm -hmm. business world. Well. When I was 16, I went to the, the local drugstore, I was looking for a job, and I got hired. And to this day, it is still my best job ever that I ever had, because we were uh, predominantly high school students and um, maybe middle-aged women, and, and we, um, we knew why we were there, we knew we were very well trained. My boss was, one of my bosses was Mr. Brandt, I st and he had a rule that the phone had to be answered by the third ring. And it wasn't that it was my job to answer the phone, it was, it was our job mm -hmm. to answer the phone. And, I rem and we had phones strategically placed throughout the, the community pharmacy, and when that phone rang the second time, you saw people running to the phone to answer it because the phone had to be answered by the third ring. To this day, if I'm in a company, I'm in a business, and I hear the phone ring. I'm still uncomfortable right. after the second One, ring. Two. Yes, okay, we got to answer. And I'll say, right. do you need to answer that phone because Mr. Brandt wants it answered by yeah. the third time? So we were trained how to answer the phone. Our expectations with the customer coming into this into the store. We had roles like this was my section to make sure the inventory was all there. We were very well trained, and a lot of the things I learned as a teenager have done very well for me as an adult. Uh, both the work ethic as well as just things that I've brought to businesses as a consultant. So we were very well trained and if we weren't, um, if, if our parents couldn't find us, 
they would call the drugstore because we were up there hanging out because we liked the people we worked with. We were like a little family. Mm -hmm. And if we had an opening, and I think this is one of the critical things, if we had an opening, we never placed an ad in the newspaper because as soon as we knew an opening was coming, somebody was going off to college, somebody was getting a, you know, this was a, a lot of us were temporary jobs or oh, not temporary, but Summer short term government. jobs. Yeah. I was there for seven years, but, uh. but, um, we would just call our friends. So we would bring in the candidates. We never had to recruit. And, and, and probably you knew who would work with the store. Yes. Kind of, yeah. yeah, because you like you hang out with like people. So if I have high work ethic and integrity, I'm probably not going to be hanging out with people you can't trust because I wouldn't trust them. So why would you trust them? Mm -hmm. And I just we we um, just loved being there, whether we were on, and we would jump on a cash register and start waiting on people if the line got long. We hadn't punched in. We weren't getting paid for it. We just were there and that was take care of the customer was ingrained in us. And that's where it started my little phrase of, of if people love what they do and they enjoy who they work for and they respect, I'm sorry, love what they do, enjoy who they work with and respect who they work for. That's really the components that I have of my best job ever. So who are you teaching that to? Are you teaching that to people looking for jobs or are you, or are you teaching that to employers that they have yes. to kind of create that environment? Employers. I, I have, I work with some people who are on the employee employee side or the candidate side. I more work with the employers saying this is what you have to do to be an attractive organization. These are the things you have to do to be best hires. And, and for years I was watching how do you keep, how do you hire and, and retain employees? And there were pieces. I mean, we talked about employee engagement. We talked about emotional intelligence. We talked about all these things. And best job ever came from if you don't do all these three pieces, if you only do one or two of the, you're not, it, it doesn't, it, it's like a table, a three-legged stool. You, you will topple over. So you have to have a system that hires the best people for you. Job fit, job fit to the manager, um, and fit to the, the, I guess, the identity or the, the vision of the company. And then you have to have people who want to come to work every day, and that's because there's no toxic work environment. They, there's no inner, uh, people like working with each other. They trust. They feel like they're a team. And then, as I said before, they also have to respect. You don't have to love your boss, but you have to respect your boss. So you have to teach leaders how to be the boss people want to work for. And we do a great disservice sometimes when we take a really valued employee and promote them into especially entry-level supervisor position. It's like taking your best machinist and then throwing them on a different machine and never showing them how to work that machine. So we oftentimes put people into jobs of leadership and we give them no training or mm -hmm. tools how to do that. And sometimes we lose a really good employee because they can't, they can't do it, they're either not fit for it, or they didn't want it, or whatever. So it's either the Peter principle, they rise to the level of their incompetence, or they're just not shown how to do that job. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, you know, it seems to me, from past experience and plenty of that there, but that, that, that it seems to me that some people will get into a position of management, and they really lose touch with the people below them because they're busy, they're busy, but everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. So how do, do you stress to employers and managers when you work with them that, you know, you cannot lose touch with people. You've got to, you've got to know what they're doing. I mean, you've got to, and they, you've got to make them comfortable enough to come to you, or you have to be perceptive enough to know when there's an issue. I think some of the best leaders and bosses I've seen have been ones that everyone in the company knows them, has met them, and I know if it's a billion-dollar company with billions of employees, you can't do that. But one of my favorite bosses in corporate was a regional vice president and we were a pharmaceutical wholesaler and he would walk the warehouse and he knew who was picking the biggest number of lines per minute which w was the you know one of the metrics and he would go out there and just say good job good job so they they know their people the, and I think that's how people feel comfortable when they when they don't see you as a suit you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and they um, and in, in smaller companies, and that's a lot of who I deal with, companies that are 25 to 250 people, there's no reason that everybody can't know each other. Right. And it seems to me that if you just recognize people mm -hmm. once in a while and that you know their name and you recognize them, that that is as, as important to a lot of people as getting a 50 cent raise an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book that was a long time ago called The One Minute Manager. 
And I read famous it, book. Sure. Yes, I read it a long time ago. But the thing that I it stuck with me today is one of the pieces of advice is catch them doing something right. And you have to you have to know to catch them doing something right. Mm. Talk about you want. Uh, I wanted to mention your podcast. You do a podcast. What's it called? Sales hiring straight talk. Okay, and and talk about the uh, and I guess you can find find out wherever you get a podcast. We just Google sales hiring straight talk dot com and you go right to it. Yeah, but we're on all the podcast listening and things. What do you focus on there? Well, I have a partner out of the New England area, out of Boston area, and um, Suzanne Paling and I do this. We we saw that there was nothing on how to hire a salesperson. There's lots of how to train them and how to manage them. But how do, you, how do you get the right talent to begin with? Because I was a trainer, and I sometimes be called in to do a, a class on sales training, and these people should not be in sales. You know, they were too shy to ever meet anybody. They were never going to ask they anybody for gonna, the sale. Right, they, they weren't going to close. And so I couldn't train that. You cannot train your way out of a bad hire. And that's actually how I got into assessments, because I thought, I'm not going to waste your time and money if it's not the right people. So we saw that there was nothing on how to hire salespeople. And so we have a six step process that we either interview other people on, on those six steps or we just talk about those. We're, our 2022 session is going to be on the candidate experience and that's really big right now. What is the candidate's first impression of you from the time they fill out the application form all the way to the job offer? And so that's what we're talking about right. in that. And I've been in sales, and uh, yeah, are you going to be supported? Are you going to are they going to come down on you the, the 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 first time you don't meet a quota, or are they going to are you going to have all the materials you need to go out mm -hmm. to the field that type of thing? Sales has probably got to be one of the hardest positions to hire for, I would think, in a lot of organizations. I don't know, right? Well, you now, were, you were, well, you were, the only reason uh, from I'm thinking that retail is really hard because mm -hmm. right now the public is so rude. I. I, I think you were asking me what the companies have to do to fill the spot. And I know we're getting away from the sales hiring straight talk. We'll come back to it. But um, I just watch how people treat basically entry level minimum wage employees mm -hmm. and even $11 an hour, which is the number I'm seeing right now. Right. When you come in and throw your food at people and start trashing the place, I just think retail workers right now are in a really tough spot, and my heart goes out to them. That's why a lot of them are quitting. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. You wanted to talk about what you're doing with these uh, SHRM, is, oh, which is it, it, it's SHRM is the Society for Human Resource Management. We have a local chapter, and during the pandemic, we started a um, special interest group called the HR Department of One. Oftentimes office managers, first level, uh, or the only HR person, and they had no one to go to and talk to, and so we, we, got, we got through COVID together. So we've been doing it for two years now, and um, it, it, these are people who uh, really have no one else and no, pla no place else to ask questions. About what? Uh, oh, well, a lot of the COVID regulations. They were being oh. asked to, to do things that they, um, that they had no guidelines and that they were changing daily. Yeah. So just to know that you weren't alone, to have that support. So the HR Department of One is another mm -hmm. group that, that I work with. Uh, to, and I've learned so much and it helps me get, keep my finger on what's going on in the, in the client base that I work with. A lot of companies, HR departments have really been gutted or they're down to one person or, or for a few people. Is that, have, have you seen that change over the years? I, would, I, I don't think so. Okay. I think that the responsibility, the role that they have to play has expanded. It used to be they were keep the risk down, make sure compliance, do the benefits, the open enrollment, but now they're being asked to manage all the COVID laws, to, to be, have a strategy for in, uh, onboarding and hiring and what's the training schedule. So when you're in HR department of one, you've got a lot of hats to wear. Mm -hmm. When you have a minute or two left, I want to ask you about team building. How important is team building, Jennifer? Is it, is it a cliche or is it important to kind of, still important to kind of build that team? I think it's important because I, if we talk about the, my three things, people who enjoy what they do, who they're in the right job, who, who like the people they work with, you got to know them and you have to have a common goal and you have to know where you fit in where, where, or where are you the piece and then respect the boss you work for. That's another team. Not only is the team I work with, but it's the team and me and the, and the employer. I mean, the boss and the employee. Right. So I think team is where we respect each other, we know each other, we work together, um, we 
pitch in to help each other and know when somebody, I'm comfortable asking you for help mm -hmm. and you're comfortable to do it with me because you don't, or you're, not, you're trying, not trying to get my job or something. Right. So I think team's always important. It's, in, it's important in sports and I think it's important in business. Got about a minute left. I wanted to just ask you, do you see any, pr maybe coming out of the COVID era and everything going on lately, do you see any permanent changes in the way job seekers and employers will have to approach each other in the future? I know that employers are struggling with the most thing right now is how to source candidates. How to, that's the number one issue. Mm -hmm. And candidates also have a problem with how do I find a job? And so I think there's a disconnect. We've got people who are looking for a job and companies looking for employees. Right. I think we've got to figure out how to get them together better because that's not, that seems to be a breakup right now. Right, because you have record number of people quitting jobs and record number of openings. And yes. Even with technology and internet, whatever, there's still a disconnect. Yes, and, and if I can do a little plug for my girlfriend, Deb Squire, she's known as the career whisperer. That's one of the things she's doing a lot of work with is how to find, how people find alternative ways of looking for jobs. Right, we're going to have to leave there. Jennifer Leek is a certified management consultant. And uh, Jennifer, thanks for coming on today. Thanks, Gene. I appreciate the invite. And this is Business Matters. Have a great day. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.